We're live. Hi, everybody. Oh, dear. I need to figure out how to, um, oh, boy. See you guys. I need to figure out how to see what you guys are up to. But anyway, we're here. We're here now, and we're celebrating an unbelievable milestone. I mean, I thought 25 years was big. You know, yeah. when you could say 25 years, it was like, that's a quarter of a century, but um, yeah, 40 years is like... That would have been 1994, 25 years. Isn't that crazy? It's, it's weird that the 90s were a long time ago now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're glad to be here, and um, we have... I think we need to start off by, by pouring a drink. <laughs> yeah, here. All right. I'll be bartender. John is the ultimate bartender. Thank there you, There you go. All right, so do you have your glasses re ready? <laughs> Thanks, Keith. He says, hey there, keep churning out those great performances. We will try, even if we have to go out there with our you walkers. Know, walkers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's to 40 years. Cheers. And here's to you for making that all possible. Cheers. Thanks for oh. keeping the music alive. Yes. So, mm. first of all, I kind of want to find out where people are watching from. So, where are you guys? Salute. Where are you guys watching from? Tell us where you are. We're in San Antonio. We just um, finished a, a show there, which is why uh, I'm kind of dressed up. Yeah. <laughs> With the, maybe I should get dressed up too. Hang on. Yeah, yeah. Get your get your okay. jacket. We're in our hotel room in San Antonio. Thank you. Cheers. Um, so where are you guys? Hey, Mark Roman. Yeah. Peace. And Siobhan and Dan. Oh, you're in Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Oregon. Excellent. We've got some Oregonians here. Where is everybody else? At Mesa, Arizona. Brooke, hi. Billy James King, you're in Tampa, of course, and Deerfield Beach, Florida. Hi, Luis. Sherwood, Oregon. Keith, Keith, you're in Cali. What does that mean? Are you by the ocean? <laughs> so good. Atlanta. Atlanta. Yay. And you've seen us twice in one year? That's fantastic. Hi, Mark. Good to see you. Okay, so... Thanks for joining us. Yeah. This is great. This is really fun. Um, we have a, a weird grab bag of stuff that we brought um, to show you guys. <laughs> Merced, California. Excellent. So, um, John, grab I grew up bag. in San Pedro. The bag. The bag. First of all, here's the famous blaster t-shirt. The, that first came out in 1981. And um, this was actually the, the blaster that we rehearsed with. Let's open this up. And uh, it had a name, and we couldn't remember the name, but our friend Miriam uh, remembered that it was called the Wilmolator. <laughs> and why was it called the Wilmolator? Because we had this song called the Flintstones, and we couldn't afford a sampler, so we just had a bunch of Flintstones stuff on this tape deck. And we ended up putting it on the t-shirt. And we named it after Wilma Flintstone. It's the Wilmalator. But wasn't there a song that we did? Yeah, it was called The Flintstones. The Flintstones. Okay, Fred. Okay, Fred. Right. And we and just... it was like, okay, Fred. <laughs> Good boy, Dino. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other thing that John used um, this tape recorder for was songwriting. Because when we first started out, we didn't have any gear. No. Like, nothing, you know? We and, had two tape decks. Yeah. And so John would stay up. I've always been the early riser and the early to bed person, kind of. And John's the late to bed and early, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, anyway, he, um, he would uh, get these two blasters together and start... And, and record on one of them and then play that one and record on the other one and then anyway that's how we did it so one night I went to bed early and I woke up in the morning and um, do you remember this yes I do and uh, he played me this 
this song that he'd done on this cassette and there were all these backgrounds on it background vocals girls. on it and they sounded like girls and I'm like where did you go in the middle of the night to find women to sing on this song <laughs> I was so pissed off and um he was uh it was all him actually but he just sang really well in falsetto so I I was a chump <laughs> yeah 10,000 cigarettes later I can't sing like a girl <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we would love, okay, so we would love to come to Toronto. We would love to come to everywhere, especially, we had such a great time in Canada last year. We played in Vancouver, BC, and we played in um, Montreal. Montreal, and both places were great. We've not played in Toronto ever, and we need to do that. So, um, yeah. And uh, let's see, what else? We have some, we have some uh, other stories for you, but. Um, we also have some questions that people wrote down in the comments uh, this week, and we are going to... Hi, Darcy. Um, love you, too. Oh, Cleo's mom. Hi, Amber. Um, we're going to answer these questions. Um, we're going to attempt to answer these questions. So, from Stephen, Stephen asked, how long did it take to move all those vans down the sidewalk, and what is your favorite pair of vans? So first of all, uh, the vans. Yeah, the van how, scene. How did they? Um, that's from Point of No Return video. Right. Speaking of videos, yeah, that's so from the Point of No Return. You take that one. So the Point of No Return video was made in between a million gigs in 1986, um, and we flew into Los Angeles and we went to the studio and we just we we filmed that thing in like 24 hours. 24 hours, like nonstop. So if you look really carefully in that video, um, when that pl that top moment when I open the closet door and all those shoes come out and like go completely over my body, I actually fall asleep on the floor during that part because I'd already been up for like 20 hours. But um, anyway, so we had to go and then the video wasn't done yet and we'd been shooting for 24 hours. So they had to get doubles of us the last scene the as they go off into the sunset it's not us it's not us if you it's, look so it's some guy in a bad a wig. Definite <laughs> wig definite wig and um yeah it's not us so anyway the vans um who how we had they had these shoe wranglers they called them because in that video they took a shoe and then they'd move it an inch and shoot a frame and then move it an inch and shoot a frame so these people would run in move the shoes an inch they'd shoot a frame and yeah do that they over. each had five shoes that they were responsible for and oh they do you would remember the them. number yeah that's amazing mr jeopardy <laughs> i didn't phrase it as a question though. yeah anyway so that was that Hi, was really pretty fun hello from tucson chinita rojas hola <laughs> Um, so anyway, yeah, favorite vans. Do you have favorite vans? Yeah, my favorite vans are Hello Kitty vans. I'm probably the only 63-year-old man with Hello Kitty vans. Mm -hmm. Yep, love that. Larissa, peace. So, um, how, the last part of that question, oh, did we answer that question? How long did it take to move all those vans down the sidewalk? I guess because we weren't there, we don't know. Yeah, but, but a long days, time. yeah. Yeah, a long time. So we also want to shout out to Scott Rice. I don't know if Scott is um, hanging out at this moment. Oh, half a day from Guam. Half a day. Half a day. I said that wrong. Sorry. We love Guam. <laughs> we did love Guam. Hope we get back there someday. Yeah, maybe when there's not a typhoon. <laughs> anyway, um, where were we? Um, let's see. Um, the next question. Oh, you were saying happy birthday to Chip's brother. Yes. Scott Rice, if you're out there listening, we want to wish you a happy birthday. So happy birthday to Chip's brother, Scott Rice. And uh, let's see. Okay. Next question. Let's pull something else out of the bag. So okay. for those of you just joining us, we have, we're in, uh, where are we? San Antonio, where we just finished a show and we're in our hotel room. And so when you're in a band, like all these on a record label, all these weird things happen. And one of the weird things, here's a weird artifact. Go ahead. Keep going. That we, uh, 
I Can't Wait was offered as a free song by Post Serials. <laughs> you can see Honeycomb, <laughs> Honeycomb, <laughs> and, um, and f you can choose five songs. To be for, on your for cassette. Your personal music cassette. We didn't even know, they never asked us if they could do this, but uh, yeah, so we're on there somewhere. On the honeycomb box. That was yeah. a that was a you know feel like you've made it in showbiz moment, right? Yeah, when you're on the honeycomb box, you've made it. Yeah. So, um, Billy James King just asked, "What's a song that you thought should have taken off that didn't?" And well, should I say yes? Of course. Yeah. I was really proud of that song. Yeah. Should I say yes? And it got to forty one, so we missed out on um, all the free Casey Kasem American Top Forty stuff that would have uh, pushed it higher. <laughs> <laughs> so we say we had two and a half hits. That yeah. was our half a hit. Yeah. It's... Should I say yes? And and um, people love that in Uganda and Zimbabwe. That's still a big. Um, yeah, dance get, club hit in Africa. Yeah, we get email emails from Africa from Africa. All the time. It's really amazing. Uh, from the, from uh, the prince of Nigeria and stuff. Mm. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So Yeah, we love that song. Yeah. Um That was written during a tornado, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah, it was down in this basement. And uh I wrote should I say yes? And when I came out, it was in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and there was this tornado, and people had been killed in it. And by oh the time I came out, the tornado was over, and it was warm, it's and like, tweet, tweet, chirp, yeah. chirp, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that uh, that arrived in a storm. Ah, uh, Larissa saying, Drifting is my fave. Ah. Uh, That's really sweet. So, um... Let's see. Hi, Julie. Hi, yeah. Darren. Oh, man. It's so great to see you guys all here on on, uh, on our Facebook page. Thanks for coming to celebrate this 40-year anniversary Salud. of our band. Um, Nostrovia. 1979, June 21st. Uh, New Shoes had their first gig in Colonel, Colonel Summers, Summers Park. Park. In Portland, Oregon. I wasn't in the band at the time. It was a four-piece. No, she was standing by the side of the stage with her fingers in her ear. I was not. <laughs> you were. <laughs> was not. Maybe it was a little loud. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was a little discordant. <laughs> yeah, the Mantronics mix of um, Should I Say Yes is really cool. He did a great job. Yeah. And that was, Mantronics mixed that at Electric Ladyland. Um Hendrix's studio, mm. which was a big deal for me being a Hendrix freak. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. got to be in Electric Ladyland with a big picture of Hendrix on the wall and an outer space mural. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good night. So, Stephen. So, how did New Shoes start to begin with? I mean, what was the impetus for the band? Since I wasn't there, I'm going to interview. Well, it kind of came out of the wreckage of this Latin band called Felicidades that we used to hang out with. And, um, I played with them and they gave me a chance to be an arranger and stuff. And then that band fell apart and two of us, uh, Larry Hagan and myself, uh, started this. We just started put. let's start a band, you know? And we looked on the wall and it was this old newspapers and these lace up shoes. And we said, oh, we could be the shoes. And then um, it turned out there was already a band called the shoes. And um, so then our bass player, Jim Hogan, Jim Hogan um, said, oh, you could be new shoes. Uh, okay, well, that's stupid. Let's be new shoes, you know. <laughs> and then he said, oh, and if you spell it like this, it's more rock. Like spell it with a Z, you know. And so we have to give him props for that. Yeah, yeah. And then about a year later, it turned into a 12 piece. Um, yeah, all the original people left but me. <laughs> and then I snagged a horn section and... Uh, then but, it really got going. But wait, when did you go to New York and decided to do that? A was horn before band? that, actually. Yeah. Because uh, Felicidades broke up in '77, then I went to New York, and I saw these real Latin bands, and I was like, "Wow, I'm not Puerto Rican, I'm not Cuban. I'm gonna go home and do something American." And I was staying in this loft, and there was nothing but a mattress, and an upright piano, and on the upright piano was a book of Motown songs, which I knew all that stuff really good. So uh, I went, I'm gonna go home and, 
and play American music. And that was really the start of it. Uh, that's, yeah. That's that, that's the real story. Yeah, because you actually grew up listening to a lot of Motown and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So. Hi, Larry. Thanks again for coming and hanging out, out with us here. We're, we're kind of new to this Facebook thing, so like reading, we're reading all your comments and sending you love and then um, also trying to answer these questions that people send in. Uh, which we'll get to the next one here. Okay, so Mark Roman, he sent in a bunch of questions that were great. Um, this one is says, tell us about that moment when you realized it's happening and that people are digging new shoes. Um, oh, what's in the drinking glass? Vodka. <laughs> Vodka. Nostrovia. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> nice. I remember, I know what my moment of like, wow, oh. this is really happening. Oh, what? Oh, yeah. You know what I'm going to say. Yeah. So you go first. Um, well, you know, it sounds counterintuitive, but um, I was really almost more thrilled to be one of the big local bands uh, than even when we got a record deal. It's nice to be on the radio and stuff, but when we got to be a local band and play the last hurrah every Wednesday, uh, that was a thrill to me. Because I think my initial goal was just to be in a band that had a t-shirt. <laughs> You know, and look. And we got the t-shirt. It and came so, true. So in the spring of 1981, this is like four, five years before we got a record deal, we had a roaring local band. And that's when I called home. I said, Mom, I've made it. Well, so we had a, a, a local band for seven years, and we played clubs like between two and five nights a week for a long time. And then um, we got a record deal. In so the band started in 1979. We got a record deal in 1986. January. Yeah, yeah, January of 1986, and then we had a record deal for seven years, and then they dumped us. So, um, and then we had a 20 year break. But your story. Oh, my story. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm not when we first got on the radio. Mark's question. Okay, so when we first got on the radio. Um, Z100 in Portland. Yeah, which is also a crazy story. I think I should tell that story really quick. Yeah, really quick. Okay, really, tell quick. really quick. I'm going to tell it really quick. <laughs> so, this is how I Can't Wait happened. Do you guys do you guys know this song, I Can't Wait? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I see a couple little thumbs up going. Okay, so, I Can't Wait um, had actually been a, a North Pacific Northwest hit. And um, we that happened because our manager at the time who was a bartender somehow was up in the morning and a local writer had written this article to say hey new shoes has made this great little cassette it's an ep with five songs on it too bad local radio won't play it like z100 they won't play local bands and so um we uh <laughs> uh i guess z100 found the article somehow yeah and, and they read it on the air. And they read it on the air, and our, and our manager, who was a bartender at the time, um, heard it, and he jumped on his Vespa and took the cassette down, and they picked I Can't Wait to Play off of it. Um, we and tried to get a record deal. Well, the phones lit up, yeah, people first of went all. Crazy. People loved that song immediately. And your big moment of feeling that you'd made it was? Was when I was driving up. Widler Street in Portland, Oregon. It was a sunny summer day and I had the windows rolled down in my car and the NZ100 on and the song comes on and I'm like, oh my god, they're playing, Z100 is playing I Can't Wait on the radio and I started singing along and then I'm like, oh, I'm singing along to the radio and I'm singing to myself, <laughs> like with myself on the radio. Anyway, it was like a kind of blow your mind experience and moment. you wanted to shout at people this is me yeah oh, i'm on the radio listen it's our music because you know after playing clubs for seven years in obscurity that was kind of pretty awesome yeah you know before that people would say oh you're in a band what band new shoes oh that's nice yeah <laughs> and then after that like all of america knew that name so oh, we'd say so, new shoes and so yeah so Beth um, Rhodes is saying she first heard it in Los Angeles on Z100. Um, Billy, I had a I had a Toyota Corolla Billy James station. King. I had a Toyota Corolla station wagon. Yep. Thanks, Keith. <laughs> 
So, um, so again, where are you guys? Where did you hear I Can't Wait the first time? We would love to know. Hi, Jim D. Can you, can you say something about... Bob Hicks is watching. Yeah, hi, Bob. Um, <laughs> so we'd love to know where you first heard I Can't Wait. People have come up to us all the time and they're like, you know... Our, our son was born because... Our children were conceived, <laughs> I can't wait. Like, that's that's better than a Grammy nomination, I think. I think so, too. <laughs> yeah, that's, yes. that's like a gra grandpa <laughs> nomination. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Anyway, so um, while you guys are writing, we're neighbor days, neighbor fair days, when I was a kid, that was... Oh, sorry. Can I pull this down? Yes, I can see it. Nick Sanford, um, Belgard, Hi. He says, Neighbor Fair Days when I was a kid. That's when you first heard the song. That's awesome. And uh, hi, Jeff from Atlanta. Wes. Wes says he heard it um, high school dance in the 80s. Awesome. Eric Stewart first heard it in Nashville. Alan Nichols in Miami on Y100. Stephen Polk, MTV. Uh, ben says, on Friday night videos on NBC. Amber says, I was addicted to the radio as a kid. Then I would go roller skating and they would always play it there at the roller skating rink. I know, it was a huge roller skating song. Isn't that crazy? So, <laughs> hi, Jim. <laughs> this uh, is like Romper Room. Uh, anybody old enough to remember Romper Room? <laughs> right, when they said hi like, to the kids. Hi, see hi, Billy. Billy and Sally <laughs> and Bob. <laughs> So Chris says he first started on 94.9 FM WVIC in Lansing, Michigan. Right on. Billy James King, most likely the Skate Depot in Cerritos, California. Cerritos. Anthony first started in Manchester, United Kingdom. My friend used to mix it when he was DJing. That's cool. Bob says, you guys are so tech savvy. No, uh, really. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> We're learning on the fly. Val, if anybody's tech savvy, it's Valerie. Yes. Yeah. So Luis says, I used to live in another part of the world, Brazil. Uh, so yeah, it played in Brazil. I remember we heard somebody heard it on Voice of America. They were doing some kind of- In um, Mongolia. China. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Not just China, but like- Mongolia. Way, way out there. Christine says she first heard I Can't Wait at a club with my ex, and we had a drink with you both. Well, great, awesome. And we're having a drink again together, Christine. Come by. Skol. Uh, Scott Willison says Q94 in Richmond, Virginia. My goodness. Raymond says Plan or Z100 New York City. WCAU Philly, that's from Dawn. And wow. Oh, Jeff King says he first heard it on FM100 in Memphis, Tennessee. So what we're, we're, um, we just asked the question, where did you first, uh, hear I Can't Wait? And that's, um... Oops, gosh, my finger just went so, all over the... <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so... See how tech savvy so, we are? So enough about I Can't Wait. Okay. Here's uh, here's another artifact. This Ooh. is John and Valerie attacked by stylists. We don't really dress like this. We never did. <laughs> uh, but this came out in Europe. Is this the... Oh, yeah. This is the, the French version. Yeah, I like that. Or no, it's Italian? Originale. No, I think it's Produit pour... Part of John Smith and Rick Words. Let's see. Oh, oh, yeah. Produit. Yeah, it's uh, French. Yeah. It's the French oui. version. We. Oui. Anyway, so we have this weird grab bag of stuff that we brought from our um, archives. And uh, I don't know. We just thought we'd grab some stuff out of it because that's what a grab Here's, bag is uh, for. When we played Disney World. <laughs> That was a funny thing, actually. We landed um, late or something, and our oh uh, yeah, our luggage got left on the tarmac, and we were playing Disney World, and our luggage got left on the tarmac, and it got totally soaked. So all our clothes, you know, we and and they were late coming to us or something like that. And a like lot that. more ruined. Yeah. So they sat on the tarmac in a rainstorm. Yeah. So anyway, we were without our suitcases. They were getting rained on. We were at Disney World and we were supposed to play that night, so we're like, we gotta have something to wear. So we start wandering around 
the bowels of the Disney World, you know, stages. Disney and, World has bowels? <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. Anyway, so um, now see, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Clothes. That Clothes. Okay, so we're looking for, you know, something to wear. And we find the costume room. So I'm like, okay, the band can be the Seven Dwarves. <laughs> going to be Snow White. We didn't end up doing that. But no. actually, uh, Gloria Estefan uh, came backstage and, and introduced herself. That was nice. She was very sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike Love says he was DJing at the only gay club in Charlottesville, Virginia, and a guy brought the cassette in and he played it. The club capacity was 50, but we jammed 100 in there easily, LOL. Oh, fire code violation. Yeah, I love that. Oh, Michelle says I played I Can't Wait in the band in Trinidad in the 80s. That's right. That's cool. Oh, that's really cool. There was a rap version of I Can't Wait by Spider D. And, yes. And that was kind of cool, too. Yeah, um, but uh, the, the best one was Buzzin'. I think, by man. Yeah, yeah, I think the, that was the there best There was one. probably 12 rap versions, 11 or 12 uh, people who took that and ran with it. And uh, my favorite one was Buzzin'. Yeah. By man with yeah. two Ns. Have you guys heard that? Have you heard the buzz, Buzzin' um, remix? 50 Cent actually added something to it, put it on his website for free, and that's what made it go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here. Heard the baseline intro to the Miami Heat. Now... Um, That's from My Holland. Miami Heat was the first NBA team to do it, and now it's kind of a basketball trope. Um, they um, they play it. At, all the NBA teams do it, but Miami Heat did it first. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Miami Heat. Uh, Michelle, see. Romy, uh, let's Kate. See. Wow. This is so cool, It's you guys. so nice that you all are watching. Yeah, we're having a blast. Let's see. Is there anything else in the grab bag here? Oh, here's our um, our uh, backstage pass from the 1986 tour. It's okay. I'm with new shoes. John drew this, actually. Yeah, this is when people wore Africa medallions uh, around their neck. <laughs> Remember that? Maybe not. Maybe not. That was a long time ago. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Anyway, we have another question to answer here. Um, how did the titles of the albums come about? Poolside, Told You So, Kung Pao Kitchen, Pandora's Box, Bagtown. Well, our manager, Rick, came up with Poolside. He did? Yeah, the, the title, yeah. Wow, I didn't remember that. And then um, I came up with Told You So. And then there's a good story about Kung Pao Kitchen because... Um, Sorry, I'm giving you some more ice. That was kind of a... Uh, how do I put this? By the time we made Kung Pao Kitchen, which was called Eat and Run, but um, Kung Pao Kitchen was a kind of in-joke because we were going to use the last of our record budget before we got dropped and buy as much Chinese food as we could. <laughs> <laughs> I was determined to just, like, eat as much Chinese food, as much Kung Pao chicken as I could on the record budget. Yeah. That's so that's that title. Pandora's Box, that was named after our song. And Bagtown, you want to talk about, tell about Bagtown? Uh, no, you go ahead. Well, um, we were going to make one last album. And, and we did. And we had a great band and a great studio right then. And so... I went out, it was like November of 2014, and I went out to the studio to start writing songs. And I wrote some classical stuff and went, nah. And then, instead I started building this city out of cardboard that took over this whole studio. And uh, my son Mal added to it, and his girlfriend at the time, Bailey, added, built stuff on it. and. Uh, Valerie would say, what are you doing? How's the songwriting going? I'm well, I'm building this cardboard city. And then we uh, made these bag puppets to live in the city. They were really great. And then the bag puppets needed a song. And so they needed a theme song. So I wrote this song called Bagtown. So that was the title of that album. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so thank you. It was Mark, about bags and cardboard. Questions. Yeah, those are great questions, man. Thank you. Yeah, really awesome. So, <laughs> so, um, what's your take on? Luis wants to know what's your take on today's music industry. There, ah. Is there an industry? <laughs> Yes, there is. <laughs> oh, good. Yes, there is. You it know, it seems th to be. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Why don't you answer it? Because you're nicer than me. <laughs> <laughs> we soul cushion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mark. Um, you got a big soul cushion baby. and you're sitting on it, baby. Um. Anyway, today's music industry actually has some great things about it. One of the things that's great about it is what we're doing here right now, which mm -hmm. is actually interacting with you. Because there were a lot of times, I mean, in the old days, uh, we tried to answer every actual letter that we got from people, but we couldn't really interact in the same way that we do now. So it's that part I really, really like. I do feel for the young people coming up in the industry today because on the one hand, there's no gatekeepers. And if they can put their stuff out there and if they're good and they're remarkable, people want to actually remark about them because they're so good, then they can do something. But on the other hand, everyone can do it. So like there's a tsunami of people out there trying to get you to listen to their stuff and it's really hard to get heard. So. So there's, you know, like like every era, there's good and bad things. Um, the good thing about our era, well, the bad thing about our era was that there were these gatekeepers, and that if you didn't have a record deal, you could not get heard. And it was a miracle that we got on the radio. It was a miracle, and 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 we know it. <laughs> and then it yeah, was a miracle it that was a real miracle. it kept happening, and that this song had a life of its own, and it just kept on having a life even when our record company dropped us, you know, like 20 years later, the song, 40 years later, because we're celebrating our 40th anniversary of being a band. But, you know. You know what I really appreciate is that people um, got into other songs besides the ones that were on the radio. Like, Larissa just wrote in and said that she loves real thing. And that was a real, um, <coughs> real labor of love, that song. Yeah. Um, because we were trying to imitate Philly soul on that, and it was, um, awesome. it, yeah, it was just awesome thing to make, you know. And so when we hear that people like drifting, or you know these deep cuts, like uh, soul cushion and stuff, uh, that that warms my heart. Um, Mark Roman said that that he loves Pandora's box mm -hmm. and. Uh, Bagtown, and that just made my day, you know, um, that that when people um, say that they like our music, that they really have gotten into the actual music and not just the hits, you know, not just our two and a half hits. <laughs> <laughs> We're grateful for the two and a half hits. Oh I my mean, God. That's, you know. Domini, Domini. Yeah, thank but, you. Um, thank but, you. you know. Uh, that people are actually listening. That's beautiful. Yeah. And and as Valerie pointed out, that the um, the internet uh, gives us a, a forum for interaction and to really hear what people think. Yeah. You know. Which is awesome. And you know, as we're talking, we're seeing all these people saying hi and you know, hot, hello from Costa Rica and all these different countries around the world. And that is just amazing. We've got some people out there who were who saw us at 80s in the sand, who are saying hello. And that was a good show, 80s in the sand. Yeah. We got the best spot in the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we just I, we just so appreciate uh, all the love and support that you guys have given us over the last 40 years. It's really been a, an amazing thing. So, hi Joel, hi Chris. Yes, 80s in the sand does rock. <laughs> we had such a good time in there. Um, so, Again, let's see, what else were we gonna ask them? Oh, so who's your favorite band, the Beatles or the Stones? <laughs> Beatles or Stones, yeah. Hi, Megan. Billy James King always asks this, it's like Elvis or Prince, you know? Yeah, And so the uh, Beatles or the Stones, we wanna know. He asked, the last time he was backstage with us, he said Beatles or Elvis. 
and that's like nah, that's no contest. Not, no. But I gotta say that Elvis was really, really talented. He was. He and, was. And even in his drugged out later big belt buckle phase. He never sang out a tune. Which is kind of miraculous, especially because monitors weren't that great in those days. There were no monitors. Right. That's what I'm saying. There were no monitors at Woodstock. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, Beatles or Stones? Okay, Beatles. Beatles. We got Beatles. Hold on. Stones. Scroll back. Aw. Your band and Animotion were the kindest. Here at the Howard Jones concert between sets watching you guys. Oh, awesome. Say hi to Howard for us. Okay, yeah. Beatles, we got Stones, we got Beatles. Okay, here's my answer to Beatles or Stones. Stones. I couldn't live without either one. Amber says the Beatles. I know, actually, that's you know what Elvis I mean? over the do you wanna Do you want to... Um, A world without the Beatles or the Stones. Or the Stones. You really don't want satisfaction and under my thumb and then you have to have come both. together and, you know, the Beatles and the Stones made one complete world. It's yeah. like saying, let's just have the Northern Hemisphere. Right. You know? Right. That wouldn't work. You know? And, and yeah, the Beatles and the Stones and Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> <laughs> Beatles. Beatles. Okay, the Beatles. George Harrison was my favorite Beatle. Yes, Don. George. Yeah. I really appreciate him. I, I actually appreciate all the Beatles at this point in time. Duran Duran. Neither, neither the Beatles Be or Stones. Well, you're young. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> Kelly. That's. <laughs> but Duran Duran was great, and they were produced by Mutt oh. Lang. So Joel's asking, what are some new bands that you're drawn to? You know who we really like? Who? Tell me. <laughs> Jacob Collier. Oh, yes. Jacob Collier is like the best modern musician. It, it's he's so good. Um, Have you guys heard of Jacob Collier? You gotta go look up Jacob yeah, Collier. Just go look him my up. God, he's amazing. He blew my mind. So look him up, Jacob Collier, the Flintstones. That's 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 a good the, introduction to Jacob good, Collier. Yeah. But he's, yeah, he's like one of the most brilliant musicians on the planet today. And I, then five years ago, like uh, Esperanza Spalding. Yeah, not even five years ago. I still think she's an amazing artist. And yeah, she yeah, keeps, yeah. She keeps growing But she came out like time. five years ago. Yeah. My friends, The Breakfast Club. Hmm. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Yeah, what is, so what's The Breakfast Club, Anthony? Is that a band? Is that the movie? Are you talking about the movie, The Breakfast Club? Anyway, um, do we have anything? While you're pondering that... <laughs> I think we have this grab bag. So we're celebrating. For those of you who are still joining us. Here's a here's a Prince backstage wait, pass. Wait, I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> we're celebrating our 40th anniversary of being a band. It happened that the first New Shoes gig happened on um, June 21st, 1979. So we're in San Antonio. We just had a show. And we're in our hotel room. And um, we're hanging out with you guys. So Jeff King says, that's like deciding between the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac for me. They're basically a tie. I know. Yeah, they kind okay. Of, yeah, that works. And those are good examples. Oh, The and Eagles and Fleetwood Mac are like from a similar planet. Yeah, absolutely. Breakfast Pl Club is another 80s band. Billy Jean King, uh, James King says he wants a, something from the grab bag. So we got to, no, not that one. We're grabbing something. So we have this grab bag of weird stuff that we brought from our house. Um, Here's the, the Minnesota Music Awards where we uh, gave the Minnesota Music Award to the Jets. Who are still one of our favorite bands to play with. We've been doing shows with the Jets recently on these um, freestyle shows and they are just, they're just great people. They're lovely. Here's the Atlantic Records 40th anniversary show. I'm not going to go into that one. I didn't have fun at that. <laughs> you didn't have fun at that no, one? No, no. No. Don't get me started on that one. Yeah. Oh, here's one. Here's New Shoes with J.J. Fad in 1988. And they were like young teenagers. They were like 15-year-olds. just kids. And they were produced by Dr. Dre. And they had that hit, Supersonic. And we're still touring with them. Yeah, we get to tour to this with day. the Jets. Now they're moms the and Jets stuff. And JJ Fad. Yeah. Supersonic. Exactly. Yes. Okay, we Let's got a couple see. more things in the grab bag. 
-hmm. So the Minnesota Awards, there we got to do a rec we got to record at Prince's studio um, for our second Paisley record Park, yeah. In Paisley Park, which was quite an amazing experience because it had just opened. And we never ran into Prince. He he was kind of a, a mystery man and never showed up. I met his dad though. And he was a little bitty guy like Prince. <laughs> And we found his costume room. Oh, yeah. And John actually tried on his boots. And no, I tried on his... There's this video where he wears this big furry jacket. Oh, the furry jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was too small for me, and I'm not a big guy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that goes... That just goes to show you. But, yeah, yeah, we had the run of Paisley Park. We just ran around like... I was playing his guitars and stuff and trying on his clothes because he had this whole room where they built costumes for him with about six sewing machines. So Joel's asking a question. So you guys ask us questions if you have These any. are great questions. They are. So Joel says, what was your, wait, 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 go, come back. What was your favorite gig and venue in the 80s and what was your least favorite and why? Okay, so I'm gonna start with my least favorite gigs. Um, and actually it's not a particular venue we tried to go top 40 in the 80s. What? Oh, yeah. Because we were in a slump and and we were having a hard time in Portland and our band members kept changing. We had over 50 different man, band members in the first seven years of the band. And so we tried to go top 40 and we played, we played sort these of lounges 40, yeah. where, oh my God, they were just soul sucking. We were the worst cover band ever ever, ever. we were terrible we at it we can only sound like new shoes yeah and um so anyway those were the worst gigs that we had but some of the best gigs that we had we loved playing it there was a place in portland called key largo um louis la bamba last hurrah last hurrah which actually the last hurrah in portland oregon kind of made our career because there was yes. a, a thing called ladies night and we played every wednesday night and one of the things that you had to do if you were playing at the last draw was you had to play original music, which is unheard of. Like you had to play at 80% original music, which is also yeah. big. We played Earth, Wind and Fire, Tower of Power, Gladys Knight, um, Cold Blood, all these different, you know, Earth, Wind and horn Fire, bands. all these horn band songs, and we did original music. So I don't know, I, it's kind of a toss up, but the, the, the la last draw and Key Largo were, were oh. our Favorite Portland clubs, anyway. Well, my favorite gig on the uh, in 1986, we played mm. 70 cities in 73 days, and my favorite one was the Fresno State Fair. Mm. Go figure! And that was just the most triumphant, beautiful gig that I played out of those 70 shows. Fresno's still great to play today. And and, and Fresno is still one of the most warm and wonderful places. Um, and my least favorite gig was the Atlantic Records 40th anniversary show. <laughs> um, and I don't need to get into it. I think we were supposed to play with Paul Schaefer. Yeah, yeah. And I'm hanging backstage with, um, you know, Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer and the band. Right. And, and then stuff. they come out and they tell us, oh, sorry, you don't get to play with Paul Schaefer after all. Yeah, so they pushed us out there, me and Val, and I'm playing a dead keyboard uh, at the Atlantic. It's oh, awful. oh, and the MC of that show. Led Zeppelin was a Led Zeppelin reunion was on that show. So every act that came out, he would go, "Ladies and gentlemen, Led Zeppelin," and then we'd walk out and they go, "Oh." <laughs> so yeah. anyway, that was my least favorite gig. Um, favorite, but favorite was Fresno. Yeah. And and any uh, last hurrah gig in 1981. Yeah. So James Pollock is asking, can you speak about your place in freestyle music history? Oh, tell the story about freestyle. That's kind of funny, actually, because <laughs> when we first started doing these freestyle shows, we did not know what freestyle was. <laughs> we thought it was like freestyle rap, you know, which makes it, you know, it's sort of like a poetry slam. Yeah. So we had to look it up on Wikipedia. Right, and we're like, we're, really? We're freestyle, freestyle artists? A dance music style derived from Miami. Yeah. With, like, using Latin percussion. That's what uh, Wikipedia said. I think, um, whoa, that was, did you hear that? That was my that hurt. shoulder. You. Um, anyway, <laughs> 
So yeah, freestyle music kind of happened on the East Coast. That's where it started in Miami. And because we were West Coast people and we played in clubs, but we played with a 12 piece, six to 12 piece band, we weren't really in the dance clubs. No. So it was kind of crazy. Once we, once um, we were on Atlantic, the music got out into the dance clubs a lot more. And so, I don't know, I think that's, that's how well, we ended up being being kind of mixed in, we were on all these different charts. So we were on the R and B chart, we were on the urban chart, which was the black contemporary chart at that time. Yeah, dance. We um, were on dance, we were on pop. So we were on all these different um, billboard charts and thankfully we crossed over into all these different areas, but we had no clue what freestyle was. <laughs> yeah, and our secret gimmick really, uh, as the songwriter, I could say my secret gimmick was to be rooted in like seven years earlier than whatever was popular. So I was like firmly rooted in the late seventies when all this 80s stuff was happening. So there you go. Yeah. So uh, Loressa says, love, 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 time will tell. Yes, that's a cool. song that a lot of people haven't heard because that was the first single off the record that we did, the last record we did for Atlantic that they never actually released. So that's a hard one to find. Um, Ricky Reedling says, I can't wait to play it about every 11 minutes somewhere around the world. Yeah, maybe it, even And more those than are that. old figures because the internet, uh, because of the internet now, um, I can't wait is played continuously around the world. There's like a Saturn ring around the earth playing I can't wait. <laughs> Thank God. So Jennifer, um, you are probably one of our biggest fans from back in the 80s. Jennifer Rafter Schoenfeld uh, says, I had that Atlantic Records 40th anniversary jean jacket. This this fan was like, un you Jennifer, you ha I have to say you were unbelievable. She She's sent us a cheesecake. a cheesecake from Chicago that was packed in dry ice. I mean, this was like unbelievable. It came to our house, we opened it up, the dry ice is like around everywhere. And it was awesome cheesecake, by the way. Yeah, also, so. she, Jennifer um, would send us these tapes of prank phone calls that she made. <laughs> Cause she was young. She would call up these old ladies and she would say, um, um, identify this song and win a prize. And then they turn on the radio and go, <laughs> and the, the poor ladies on the phone would go, oh, I don't know, I'm old, and I don't know that kind of music. Anyway, <laughs> you, you were a crazy teenager, and we loved you for it. So, hey, so Keith, our friend Keith, is asking a question here that's good. Is the most interesting instrument you've ever used in the studio a wine bottle? Well, that was certainly interesting. Hi, Sean. Um, interesting instruments. Hmm. Yeah, that probably was the wildest thing that we did was wine bottles because we drank the wine. We had to empty the wine bottles before we played them. So first of all, you have to provide a little background here. I Can't Wait was being recorded at the studio um, in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, that's not gonna work. No. Um, so, I Can't Wait was being recorded, what year was that, 1985? Five. And it was just kind of laying there. Like, it wasn't coming live. And Because I slowed it down, because we played it too fast. We did. We, we, we used like, to play it like, dun 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 It was like running. <laughs> you know, I, we, we were just <coughs> embarrassed about it, you know, and wanted to get it over with, I think, on the bandstand. Yeah. And then in the studio, I slowed it down to 104 BPM. So it was like, dunk, dunk, mm -mm. And everybody, Valerie, the band, thought I was crazy. Yeah. But then the track just laid there and it wouldn't go. And then um, on the way to the studio one day, I was listening to the, to the time, Jungle Love. Oh. And oh, I, oh, we, oh, we, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, Jungle Love. Um, <laughs> And, and I cop, I just stole these bottle parts and percussion parts from it. And so that's the wine bottles. So yeah, we get to the studio, we have to tune the wine bottles. And so, you know, you have to drink a certain amount of the wine in order to make it the right pitch in the track. So that's And at the end of drinking these two bottles of wine, I couldn't tell the pitch. That doesn't work. No, these glasses are too thick. Yeah. 
And now vodka comes in plastic bottles. I was, Raymond <laughs> says, I was bummed to hear that you ended the band, so I can't visit Portland to see you as a headline uh, act. What future projects are you working on? Um, mm. I'm doing a graphic novel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we I'm, just couldn't find, you know, enough space in Portland to uh, play gigs, play enough gigs, keep music fresh. So, yeah. But our band was so great. I know. We miss them. Yeah. They, they, it was probably one of them. There was seven different versions of New Shoes. And that was the last one. And it was just everybody got along, you know? Yeah. It was really nice. Plus they were all great players and singers. And, yeah. And we do miss them. So music projects, um, not so much right now, but I'm working on a podcast for singers called Living a Vocal Life. It's going to launch in October. And I've been interviewing um, some really great singers from all different... Um, uh, how, how do I talk about this? Um, I've been interviewing singers that uh, live all kinds of different lives related to music. So there's some 80s singers that I'm interviewing. There's some people who are teachers that, um, that have you know a vocal studio that I'm interviewing. It's just about how to be a singer in today's world. Musical theater people. Musical theater people. So I'm interviewing people from all different walks of life with all different kinds of careers, but who all have singing and a love of singing in common. So that's gonna launch in October, and I hope you guys will, I'll try to let you know about it, because it's really, it's really, really fun. And I'm also creating an online class for singers called, um, called Becoming a Singer, and that's gonna launch next year. So those are the things that I'm working on. Okay, um, as a couple who has worked and loved together for over 40 years, what's your secret to relationship success? I think one answer is that after our record deal ended, we both went off and did other music separately. Yeah, we did. And so when we came that back to helpful. make Pandora, um, we had all this experience um, separately. Valerie played in big bands and, um, and jazz combos and taught voice for a long time. I, I did advertising for 20 years. And then... We made the Pandora's Box record. Actually, we made a big band record together. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And then we did, so we were doing some jazz together. and But I think uh, my answer would be that, um, you know, we've had actually probably over 40 years, we've had probably at least seven different relationships. In 44 that time. years. 44 years, yeah. Um, we've been together. And um, his sense of humor uh, is pretty amazing. And so... That really, that really helps. I there's no secret exactly. It's just you know. Find someone you really like. Yeah, yeah. So favorite artist on the freestyle explosion tour. Oh, that's, oh, that's a not hard fair. One. Yeah, we we like can't too say. Many. No, it, but too many. you know, I gotta say that um, that all the acts on the freestyle explosion tour uh, have become pals, and um, I'll never forget the first show that we did. And we're in the van with Lisa Lisa, and we were big Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam fans, Cult Jam fans. And um, all of a sudden, we're in the van with Lisa Lisa. I know. Whoa. And Lisa Lisa just opened the door for me. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it was great. really awesome. So, if that's a, a good enough answer. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the other thing cool, so we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. You those of you who've been hanging out for this whole almost hour now, um, we've been uh, celebrating this momentous occasion where the band had its first gig on June 21st, 1979, and here it is 40 years later, and you know, the band's still happening. So we get to be um, on this freestyle tour where we play with 10 to 12 other artists on these shows and it's just the hits and it's one of the best things about it is hanging out with all the other bands after the show and also the people who work on this tour who make it go all the production people and stuff so natalie and rj Duran. who we love who we just love that work for pacific concert group oh yeah they got us this beautiful present and they presented it to us after, after, our set. after our set tonight on the sh on on stage, 
It's this cake. It's this new shoes. I can't wait 40 more years. Sorry, probably won't be 40 more years, but I mean. <laughs> I'll only be 104. <laughs> Get out of here. Anyway, so if you want to come over and eat some cake with us, we're, uh, you know, hanging out in San Antonio. And um, we're in our hotel room after after the show. And I think I think it's almost time to say goodbye. Are there any last minute questions that you have for us uh, at this moment? We've been here. Oh, will you be performing at any freestyle events in LA? Yes. yes. We are going to be in Anaheim on, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting. It's in July. It's, I think, the last weekend in July. So you can go to um, our website, newshoesmusic.com. And um, Anaheim's not exactly LA, but it's pretty close. So yes, we will be doing a freestyle show there. Um, and <laughs> I love it. So I'm reading, I'm reading some of these comments here. Okay, Val, what's your TV show fave? Oh yeah. Hmm. What's my TV show fave? Um, she watches series. Yeah. I watch Jeopardy. <laughs> he watches Jeopardy every night. Since 1984. Yeah, I've missed actually, about five. <laughs> he's actually really good, which is... I'm, I'm watching um, the last episodes of This Is Us right now. But um, t favorite TV show? I don't, I don't get to watch TV that much, actually. I listen to a ton of podcasts. And um, mostly like the TED Radio Hour and some of those. On I'm, Being with Krista Tippett. Yes, On Being with Krista Tippett. So I'm a big podcast fan, partly because I'm doing a podcast right now. It's going to launch in October, but anyway. So Wes wants to know, John's doing a graphic novel, and it's re he's a really talented artist. Yeah. I wish I could show you some of the art that he's doing. Um, I don't know when that's going to um, be happening. I think that stuff will start going up and they'll be um online you mean yeah yeah online mm -hmm. um probably around september yeah so this winter a lot of things will be coming out so draconia skyward wants to know which 80s singers um so far i've inter i've uh, interviewed moana from the jets and um rindy ross from quarter flash I've got another interview with uh, Susanna Mars, who's a wonderful musical theater singer from Portland, Oregon. Um, who's Trying great. to get Jody Watley. Um, and then a young jazz singer named Holly Pyle. Um, so we're I'm trying to get a real diverse group so that um, young singers can maybe be inspired by how many different ways there are to become a singer. Um, that's that's the that's the gist of the show anyway is to try to inspire and help younger singers um, who who want to make a life out of music because it's not easy. <laughs> so um, Greg oh, wants to know question. was the bass line I'm thinking a mini moog a mini moog I was able to get pretty close to it with Arturia's reincarnation of the mini moog I have a pretty close set of stems including finding glass bottles filled with varying amounts of water to try and match. Nice. It's fun trying to recreate the magic. That's really cool, Yes, Greg. it was a mini Moog, and the sound was wow. dialed in by Nate Phillips of Pleasure. Um, and you know what? I have a mini Moog, and I have never been able to get close, not even close, to that uh, percussion that he put on it. Dum, 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 dum. Like, yeah, yeah, Nate dialed that in. I, I never could get it out of my mini. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Anyway, um, oh, thank you, Raymond. He says he enjoyed listening to the band on our Bagtown and PBS special. Oh, right on. Which was really good. Oh, that's a great idea. Mike, so I was just talking about the podcast, and Mike uh, Love is suggesting that I interview Imogen Heap. We I would love her. love to get her. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Great idea, man. Great idea. We will try We will try doing that. Um, oh, Rob is asking, gosh, we could stay here forever with you guys. <laughs> what is y'all's biggest music influence? Oh, my God. You really, <laughs> we could so go on all night many. for that. Uh, it depends on Charlie what Parker, you're... Coltrane, Hendrix, um, James Brown, James Brown, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Earth, Wind, and Fire, 
and especially Coltrane's piano player, um, McCoy Tyner. Yeah. I, I just wanted to be McCoy Tyner, and I ended up in new shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. Could have been worse, right? <laughs> oh, anyway. Yeah. And let's see. Oh, is Joel he... wants to know, is Malcolm following in your musical footsteps? No, but he's following in John's artistic footsteps in a way. And actually, he's... he's... He was born really good. Yeah, Malcolm is our son, by the way. He's our 24-year-old who is also on the artist path. And he started God drawing at age three and a half and just never did anything else. Yeah. You know, and so, <laughs> yeah. He's got a lot of good... Um, he's got about four comics going. Uh, anyway, you guys have been so great. And um, I guess there's a couple more questions here we're trying to get to before we go off because we've been... <laughs> We've been on here almost an hour. Aren't you getting bored? <laughs> We're not, but um, <laughs> will yeah. Pulsite ever be remastered with bonus tracks and remixes? Kevin Kelly wants to know that. Um, I don't know if there's many bonus tracks. You know, Atlantic still Atlantic Records was our label, and they still own the masters of all of our music. So I would say the bonus tracks that you if you're interested there on um kung pao kitchen yeah that that we kind of took everything that was rejected by the label and uh redid it and um not redid it but we re remixed, remixed it, it and remastered it and made it our own again and if you want to look at um pre pool side it's uh the record that's right yeah 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 and so uh, that that's the bonus tracks. Aw. Uh, Don Wyckoff says, thank you for your music and your light in the world. Uh, thank you, Don. We just, you know, so appreciate being able to do this still in our lives. Um, we will, uh, let's see. Emily says, we'll see you in Anaheim. Thank you for our soundtrack in, wait. In Mark this... Roman says, thank you for our soundtrack in this life. Cheers, happy anniversary. Um, if you do want to know where we're playing, thank you, Chris, for putting up our <laughs> the URL for our shows. You can go to newshoesmusic.com slash shows, and you'll find out there. Thanks again, everyone, <laughs> for... Um, for hanging in there, for I one know, thing. Yeah. All these years. And, oh, here's a good question. Not music-related. What's your favorite thing to cook? Mm. John, at... About 20 years ago, I said, you know what? I'm done cooking. It's your turn now. And, and I didn't have a job, so I had to justify my existence somehow. <laughs> Not 20, 20 years ago you had a job, but more recently. Yeah, well, 10 years ago. Anyway. Um, and so I started learning to cook, and especially on the road with the freestyle tour, um, there's nothing to do but watch the Food Network. <laughs> Diners, drive-ins, and dives. So, yeah, I do all the cooking now, and... <laughs> And what is my favorite thing to cook? I, um, my two specialties are chicken curry chicken and curry chicken curry. Mm. Yeah, those two things I make really okay. well. He's, he does really, he's actually a really good cook. I'm so lucky. Um, let's see. Where do see. modern politics and 80s music come together for you? Uh, you'll have to call us. <laughs> <laughs> We'll do that on Todd a whole Corgan. other one. Todd Corgan. I did a great little indie movie with him. Todd Corgan. Yeah, he made The Man with the Empty Room. Where are you seeing that? Right there. Oh. And we never got to work together again, but that was a great experience. Yeah. A filmmaker who walks in knowing what he wants. God. <laughs> yeah. We got, we got so Hi, lucky. Todd. Oh, Heather. Heather um, Hex is wondering about the Flintstones song. And actually, we talked about that earlier when we were talking about... The Wilmalator. And this New Shoes t-shirt, which is, you know... I think that the Flintstones song exists somewhere on a cassette in a box in a closet. And we're getting ready to move, so we're going to go through all those cassettes. Yeah. So I'll get back to you, Heather. Yeah. We'll, we'll find that, and maybe somehow... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could let that out. Yeah, we could. That'd be really interesting. Yeah. It was a it was a tune that we played live. So we had a band for seven years. Um, 
then we played in clubs, and then we had a record deal for seven years. So Nucci's was a real ongoing concern for 14 years, from 1979 till about 1982. 92, yeah. Excuse me, 92. I can't do math after I've been drinking vodka. Um, anyway, so uh, we played a ton of music. We had over 50 people in our band yeah, in that 70, time period. 70 band members and crew. Wow. And anyway, they all contributed, you know? Yeah, so many people made new shoes go, including all you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you again for hanging in there. And um, I think we're going to... I think we're going to say good, good night. Thank you so much. This was really, really fun. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it another time when there's something else to celebrate. What is 40 years from now? <laughs> 70, uh, You're asking me to do math at the let's end. Let's see. What is it? 2019, 29, 39, 49, 59. So we'll be back in 2059. Oh, my gosh. On this day. <laughs> be there. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Have a great night. Kampai. Kampai.